Kia ora, my brothers and sisters, I'm Celestial Serpent and today we're going to talk a little bit about sacred geometry, mathematics and all extrapolated subjects. Now I'm here with Jane 108 who is an author of about 20 books, 10 DVDs, a lecturer and a teacher in, in the local area. So, so why don't you tell us a little bit about your work which is very different from the conventional mathematics that we might find in the schooling system. Right, so my work started about 30 years ago when I was learning a new concept of mathematics where we turn numbers into pictures because as I grew up to become a doctor I had to do the high level of math. So a lot of students like me who were born in the 1950s and 60s, we struggled to learn this high level algebra and calculus. So evidently a lot of people just shut down because they didn't actually understand it but they passed the exam. So people like me, um, I went on a journey, a quest, so I renunciated a medical career, went and lived two years with um, Papua New Guinea, off the coast of New Guinea, in the Torres Straits for two years, and I learned sacred geometry watching how water flows and a leaf would mm. fall and spiral, so I got my education in the rainforest. So then I came back to, to teach my comprehension of nature, I call it the living mathematics of nature. Beautiful. So then I started to teach it into schools here, and I found that over the, the decades, a conventional maths teacher would be a little bit overwhelmed when you're talking about um, three-dimensional nautilus shells and fractal harmonics and torus. So I found that to get into a school, I had to hold back from teaching sacred geometry, even though that's my passion. I found that I could talk, if I could talk a mathematician's language, like say, hey, we can improve the ability of your students, those that are failing in maths, we can get them really sharp, increase their yep. confidence, memory power. There's a thing called Vedic Maths. So mm. Vedic Maths means if we, we want to multiply something like, um, say, 25 squared, how, how can you multiply 25 squared in your head, no pen and paper, no calculator, because we don't want to give our knowledge to the external machine. We, we are an internal human biocalculator. <laughs> so I did the first DVD, one of my 10 DVDs, I did the first DVD in the world on this thing called rapid mental calculation, what you would call speed maths. So I found that if I, if you were a maths teacher at Byron Bay, I could say, hey look, there's this amazing system from ancient India, two and a half thousand years ago, and it's based on pure principle, and the kids can do maths up here. And so I could create a dialogue with you, and they say, yeah, come in and show the kids how you can do 25 squared. So I could, I can sort of create an internal screen, see the data 25, I multiply the 2 by the next number of the 25, so 2 times 3 is yep. 6. So I've already got half my answer. And the last digit, 5, I square it, so 25. So within 2 seconds, or at the speed of thought, the answer is 6, 25. I didn't write anything down, I saw a pattern. So when you start doing mathematics from the right hemisphere, that's the visual cortex, that we call it the feminine brain. You see the answer it's about the universal language of pattern recognition. Whereas when we went through school, we were learning through the left brain, the logical, rational. And it's good if you want to become an engineer and do structure. But if you want to get into what I call galactic maths, mm. we have to get out of base 10, which is the decimal system, and go into another thing that the ancient Babylonians discovered was a thing called base 12, like our clock. When we look at our clock, it's actually based on 12 hours, 24 hours, in 60 seconds, 60 Absolutely. minutes. Absolutely, and that fr that gets fractal into astrology right. as well, so the zodiac, and the so key it's universal. To, so those two numbers, 12 and 60, are time codes. So there's only one pattern I know, in the, there's only one sequence of numbers I know in the universe that captures base 12 and base 60, and that's called the Fibonacci sequence. Mm. And the Fibonacci sequence, as you most people already know, is based on this um, torus. Um, you can see the spiral here just... Um, going, um, emanating out. See this explosion? So while you're seeing this explosion, there's another thing. We, this is what technology is based on, is explosion, blasting, rocket fuel, pollution. It's an outer technology. But the real technology is that when we start studying the galactic maps, if you turn it around, you'll start seeing now implosion. So now you can see it's sucking in. So that's what nature does. We don't just do explosion. So the unification of two forces, the explosion and the implosion, is united through the toroidal domain. So this is all based on um, the mathematics of pine cones and sunflowers, mm. that spiral. Yeah. Or, or the three-dimensional view of it would be to say those numbers that make up nature 
is 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. So the ratio of 13 to 8 to 5 to 3 to 2 to 1 is a specific mathematical ratio called the golden mean. Absolutely. So this is the key. We, we, so what, I, what I'm telling math teachers is that 100 years ago, our, the legacy of mathematics today comes from ancient Greek Pythagoras, 2,500 years ago. But something happened 100 years ago where they took out all this mathematics of the Fibonacci sequence and the platonic solids. They just took it all out, and that was the visual component. So that's why we've gone through this kind of um, um, disassociation with the left and right brain. It's, I'm not saying it's a lobotomy, but we've been disassociated. So by teaching children visual content like sacred geometry, it creates what I call whole brain learning. And it's a universal language of pattern recognition. So the, the secret was I learned was teach schools Vedic maps, get into the door. But once you're in the school, then you can take your shoes off and teach magic squares, golden mean, whatever you want. But I was doing it back the front. Yeah. It took me two decades to realize, do like, you know, in Caesar's world, you, you do what Caesar does. So if they're teaching dry curriculum, even though it's a factory style, you, you just participate, but then you show them that there's another way. So when I realized that you don't fight the system, you create the new model. That's Buckminster Fuller's mm. realization. Don't fight the system, create the new model. So, so Buckminster I, Fuller, um, I really love the work of um, Buckminster Fuller. Everyone that ever studied with him, like Dan Winter, Drumvala Melchizedek, Nassim Harriman, all the world teachers on sacred geometry were all his students. So every one of his students Interesting. became like a master of geometry because he taught the pure principle. So Buckminster Full so this is all based on golden mean. The reason why this is special is that if this edge length is eight units, that means that the radius from the center so where my finger is so from the center of the poly polyhedron to this nodal point would be 13. So the ratio of 8 to 13 keeps that golden mean ratio. It makes it means that the wavelengths are coherent. They could, could never crash. So this is a perfected shape. In fact, to me, it's the most important shape. But the shape that Buckminster Fuller, talk, Buckminster Fuller talked about was another shape called the cube octahedron. So this shape here, it's not based on the golden mean. This shape here is based on, this is all 1.618813 ratio. Now this shape here is based on the root of 2. It's not actually golden mean, but this is, this is the fusion of a cube and octahedron. And you can see that it's got um, 6 squares and 8 triangles. But the beautiful thing about this shape is that it can morph. So if I took, if I if I re rebuilt this cube octahedron, and and um, I'll put it down here. There's a triangle here. I'm holding two triangles. I can squash it. It has compression. So which it means that if I put the triangle face down, and I hold the opposing triangle from above, if I just slowly twist it, or just pushing straight down, it's morphed or shape shifted into a fluorite crystal, octahedron. All I did was take a basic shape and I squeezed it. That's the key word in the universe is compression. Yeah. And if I was to compress, but if I went half compression, if I just went squeeze like that, not a full squeeze, a half squeeze, and if I could, if you could imagine a stick going from there to there, it becomes equal. So that, that, this shape now, if you just hold that, that's the icosahedron of 20 triangles. So a half twist makes what you're holding. It does so, change, yeah. so if I squash there, I've made octahedron, I squash again, I get a pyramid. But if I do it again, I squeeze one more time, I end up with the basic building block of all atomic structures called the tetrahedron. And this is the one shape that makes everything. So the reason why this is so, it's called vector equilibrium. The reason why it's called equ has equilibrium is because it's the only shape in the universe where if magic spider was in the middle of that center point and I measured that distance from there to a node that let's call it one unit or a matchstick imagine that what I'm holding there is a matchstick length it's the only shape in the universe where that matchstick radial there's 12 radials is the same length as the outer length that I'm holding mm -hmm. that means that the inside is the same as the outside that's what fractal means fractal mm. means is to have the big picture is the same as the small picture. The universe is the same as the atom. 
And the only way that we can travel through the dimensions without self-destruction is to utilize the mathematics of flowers called 1.618. So this is the most fractal shape. If I picked up another shape, any shape, say a cube, and magic spider was at, in the center, and you, this edge length is different in length than the distance from the center to the node. Let's say this was six, this could be eight. They're not, they're not the same. So fractal means self-similar. That's the definition, self-similar. Yeah, and, and, and fractality is a very interesting thing because I mean, the example you're giving of, of compression and the way forms change, I mean, this is, this is something that we can apply to, to mm. astrophysics and you know, just mm. looking at how all consciousness is created and how the different frequencies and dimensions, mm. what, like how, how an, an object or, a, or an entity would would change as it ascended or descended through dimensions. That's right. So it's, it's, it's really the key to a lot of kind of sci-fi technology as well. And just still continuing on with that about circ um, the, the measurement of the earth grid, yeah. if, if this shape here, if I was to put my fingers around it, you could see that there's a six-sided shape. It's a hexagon. So I'm holding one hexagon. That's one hexagon. And I turn it around, there's another hexagon. There's actually four symbols of sixness. There's a hexagon there. But if I did that on the Earth, if I was to look at the cube octahedral coordinates of the Earth, you would, you would see this shape. So this is called four great circles. So I've got four copper rings. And if, if it's done correctly, you can see that that's a square triangle, square triangle. So it's exactly the same shape. But this time I'm allowing for the curvature of the Earth. So this is a really interesting... So it starts off as just four rings. Yeah. And just with a little bit of um, movement, you can adjust these rings. So all sacred geometry is studying spheres and mapping great circles. And you could have three. What happens if you've got three great circles or eight or six or 12? They, they create all these exotic shapes, but some have more magic than others. So, so the reason why I'm showing you this is that if we want to stargate, if we want to travel into other solar systems, we have to understand the curvature of the Earth. And the relationship of the curvature to the square is called pi. And my, my, so if this, if this is a circle, the, the distance going from there to there, we call it one unit. So you, the, and you know that there's a square that goes around this circle. So the traditional value of pi, if this is one, how many times does this distance of one go? If that was like a string, if I could take this one unit as a string and lay it over there, there's one two, three, and just a little bit. It doesn't, it does three and a little bit. So pi is called 3.141. But because we understand fractal mathematics and the mathematics of the golden mean, this is the three-dimensional view of the Fibonacci sequence. By understanding this 1.618 ratio, we understand that the true value of pi is not 3.141, it's actually deficient. The, it's a disharmonic value. The true value of pi is a fraction more. It's called 3.144. And I've written, I've written a book on that. It's in the title here. So the first book I wrote is called The True Value of Pi Equals 3.144. That's the Book of Five, Volume 8. I've written 20 books, nine books just on the golden mean. It's like I'm a professor just on 1.618 ology i'm just obsessed oh, it's, about it's, it's, it just goes forever doesn't it yeah and just by understanding the living mathematics of nature the mathematics of pine cones and seashells we understand that there's a fundamental error in in pi so um then i wrote a second book about that so this is called volume nine and it's looking at the how did i mathematically derive that pi is deficient and it came from an email I've, I've been researching this as you know for 20 30 years and as i was about to publish my discoveries um a, a, an engineer called Smokey, an ex-engineer from nasa he was they were make when they were making the moon craft they were making they were making all these beautiful cylinders and they found that for for think for the legs of the moon craft for, were all cylinders so anything to do with circle and engineering is based on pi. But they found that every time they were making cylinders, they had to fudge pi a little fraction to make it fit perfectly. To, for, to make the cylinders and, and, and the machinery work, they had to fudge pi. Even when they had to drop, when astronauts re-entered Earth and they had to land 
in this part of the ocean. Well, they landed 20 kilometres away from where they thought. So all mathematics of satellites, mobile phones, it's all based on understanding pi. If pi is wrong, then everything we know in our history for two and a half thousand years is incorrect. So even when they landed the moon, moon craft, if, if there really was a moon craft landing, that they, were, they stated that where they thought the craft was landing was 20 kilometres off as well. So we know that pi has another value, but it's never been released. It was discussed in the, by a Swiss farmer called Billy Myers, with someone like Edgar Cayce, I think in around the 1940s, 1930s, 1940s, he was abducted and taken on into a space journey, and he came back with all this knowledge, and he wrote volumes and prophecies, a bit like Edgar Casey. And in one of his writings, he said that the the value for pi has been miscalculated, and that when scientists are are, are alerted to this fact, the technology, the physics on, on planet Earth is going to go the next octave. Which means, if we want to know how to go through the wormhole, how to time travel, how how to even take our physical bodies from here to Mars, like in a jump room. We can't do it right now because we would molecularly destroy ourselves. Yeah. Because the area, the curvature, the, the mathematics of curvature is in error by that little fraction, but that's enough to create distortion. So I believe that the reason why I'm teaching all of this is that the next generation children are going to grow up with this acute awareness that sacred geometry is a universal language and that we need to correct the true value of pi. So Billy Myers had written about it, so I believe that my work is a fulfilment of a prophecy that's been written for 50 years. And there was also a Greek professor 20 years ago called Professor Stephanides. He's written all the equations to get this value 3.144 in fourth dimensional equations. So with my work, Stephanides' work and Billy Myers, we've got enough evidence, if we had to, like in a courtroom of mathematicians, yeah. we can show how pi is derived from the golden mean, from this 813 mathematics of the divine proportion. We have irrefutable evidence that we can understand the mathematics of curvature completely. We don't even need pi. We don't even need to know 3.144. We can measure everything in terms of the divine proportion, the mathematics the mathematics of seashells is all we need is to measure everything we know. So what I'm calling for is a conference, a forum as as it would be called, where the top mathematicians of the world who believe in pi have to prove to us, we don't have to prove to them, that like a, a mathematician, if you said to a mathematician, what's pi? They just say, oh, it's 3.141. But they've just got that from pushing... Compu buttons on a computer mm. they can't actually physically prove that even when Not Archimedes true. discovered an approximation of pi he even said it was only an approximation because they didn't understand curvature then which is how we got into a satellite satellite age is that we understand the curvature of the planet now a bit better than we did 50 years ago so I'm calling on a universe uh, international conference to get people together and actually just have a debate so that's why the title of the book is called Is Pi a Lie? I'm not saying pi is a lie because that creates a confrontation. And let's look at the mathematics in your textbook and prove to each other fundamentally if there's a flaw in the logic. You know? yeah. We've been doing this for thousands of years. Yeah, yeah, that's, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, and, and as you see, you know, it would really change the whole world if, if we did have some symposium and, and recalibrated all, our, yes, all the mathematics, you know. It, it's, we'd, we'd also be ending a lot of other archaic ideas and philosophies yeah. that are no longer serving us. And Correcting the mobile phone frequency which is causing yeah. cancer. So oh. we're so close to getting universal communication, but you can feel it when you put a phone to your ear for an hour, your, your, your brain's being fried. Yeah. So there's nothing wrong with electromagnetics, it's just that we haven't, we're slightly out, just a fraction out. Yeah. And yeah, so it's really exciting times. I feel like this is a contribution to a better world. Yeah. You know? And 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 I was I really like it as a metaphor as well as like you know, the way we calculate pi is very masculine like like you're using lines and linear attribute but we're not fully understanding this this curvature the circumference yeah. which is the feminine in sacred geometry the line masculine, the circle being feminine and it and it feels like for the last two thousand 
2,500 years, it's been a very male-dominated energy to the planet with the legal system, religions, all that whole infrastructure. So it, it feels to me like this is part of a, a, a conscious evolution that mathematics happens to be the, the language or the, you know, it, it's it's what is pushing and, and pulling all creation. And, and I feel we're really moving towards a better system holistically through a knowledge of sacred geometry. Mm, I was just looking for one diagram, but basically um, to get this true value of pi, let's call this circle here like a pizza. Yeah. So Archimedes two and a half thousand years ago, they said if we divide the pizza, say, into eight units, we get a slice of a pi. So they took that pie like a triangle. So you can visualize that if there's a triangle, they put a, they drew a straight line there, but from the straight line to the curve, there's a little gap between yeah. the pizza, small pizza slice, the eighth of the pizza. And they thought the logic, the fundamental flawed logic for two and a half thousand years, is quite remarkable, is they thought that if we divide the pizza into 16 smaller slices, we'll, that little straight line there gets smaller and smaller so you then they can thought, minimize it but that's all yeah we'll, we'll um, slice it up into a thousand pieces they've even sliced it up into a million and now billions of little slices and all they're doing is adding up lots of little straight lines they're not actually adding up the curvature which is the mathematics of the torus so they believe the logic is oh it just disappears so we and that's the problem the calculus measures area under the curve so if what I'm saying is true, even everything we know as, as calculus is fundamentally flawed. And that's why when I was at school, I knew there was something not right. It's always troubled me. For 30 years, my whole feeling about maths, there's something missing, and I didn't know what it was. And that's why I went on my quest. And now I can say that I, f I understand now that the, the Cheops pyramid, the only way to get the true value of pi is to understand the height of the pyramid. And it, it come, Plato spent a lot of his. Plato was Pythagoras' student. Um, Plato, Pythagoras was 500 BC. Plato was about 300. So there was a 200 year gap. But Plato wrote many books on it. I've actually got it here, actually. The Republic of Plato. So they discussed all this stuff. Plato was saying that there's magic numbers like um, 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 times 6 times 7 equals a number like 5,040, 50, 40. So they believed, they discussed sacred geometry saying that if we want a perfect world, we can't be overpopulated, so that we're going to create satellite villages. So when we reach 5,040, based on 1 times 2 up to 7, we have to create a new village and a new village, whereas like our logic with population is that we just keep expanding, like viruses growing yeah, out of control so that's not very harmonic is it so expansion? two and a half thousand years ago they were discussing population control based on sacred geometry and sacred numbers so they knew all this stuff and they discussed the pyramids in egypt in here they went and visited the egyptian pyramids yeah and, and well, they, pythagoras was said to have studied there for a, a long period of time years. and to be initiated into that yeah. mathematics and he was again one of the the fathers yeah. Of, of, of many subjects, mathematics being, and, and you know, and sound harmonics. Yeah. And again, yeah, that, that he, he said that, that he got his information from the Egyptians who That's show right. in their structures that, that they know pi and phi and the relationship between them. So to get, so, so to get the um, true value of pi, they took the square of, imagine there's a pyramid up, going up here. Yeah. So there's four, the square base four, divided by the height. The height, if this was one, so if this if this distance was one here, half of that edge, the height is 1.272. It's called the square root of the golden mean, the square root of that 813 ratio. So four divided by the height of the pyramid in Egypt gives us that precise value, 3.144. But it goes infinite, it doesn't stop there, it just keeps going infinite. Mm. Um, yeah, so, so basically this cube... To, to, to understand these harmonic numbers, this cube contains everything sacred in it. If, if this unit is 1, the diagonal is called square root of 2. This distance here is called 1.414. We call it root 2. The diagonal going through the space, the space diagonal going from here to there, is called the square root of 3, which is 1.732. So we've got root 2 in the face diagonal, root through spatially, but the critical square root, the harmonic that we need to get the true value of pi, 
first of all we have to understand that when we're talking about the golden mean the 813 ratio if this is 13 this is 8 5 3 2 1 the ratio that's consistent as this goes into the universe and that goes into the atom the resolution of this three-dimensional phi spiral is the torus so this is the torus that resolves all the mathematics of nature it's hyperdynamic it's universal connects the big picture to the small picture mm. but to get the golden mean so after if you did a weekend seminar you learned that the, the golden mean to get this 1.618 has a formula so the formula is called 1 plus the root of 5 whatever that is divided by 2 means a midpoint so 1 plus another distance and we take the midpoint so to get root 5 so if we can understand what root 5 is root 5 is when we take a double cube so this cube plus another one on top creates a diagonal that's called root 5 like 1 is to 2 we take that diagonal and now if we know what root 5 is we can crack a code so the secret to getting the true value of pi was to create a circle where the diameter of the circle was the diagonal of the double cube now this double cube is Thor's hammer if you look at a lot of these Hollywood movies about where did Thor get his power from it's it's called it's from the double cube because the double cube contains the mathematics of the universe. Yeah. So the, the, so when they talked about Thor's hammer, it was a double cube. Um, there's been some other amazing movies that show the secret meaning behind the 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 harmonics in this. Yeah, and so, that, that can also be referenced to Metatron's cube, the double square. And so and the hypercube. That's right. So that is the, the cube within the cube. So th so this is our starting point. This is like you turn the car on. You, this cube is is the crucible of creation. It just holds it. it do, it's turning the car on, but the car's not going. Once you start going hypercube, where you put this cube all around it, it creates a fourth dimensional cube, and that's where it goes fractal. So we need a starting point. Turn the key. Once you go hypercube, Metatron's cube, you can travel because it contains the root 5 in all spatial directions around it. So the secret was, it took 30 years of research, is that if we set the circle, the diameter of the circle, not to 1, but to root 5, and we, and we said, what's 1 plus root 5 divided by 2? We end up with a circle inside. We work, it works out that pi is the golden mean. There's a relationship between pi, the circle diameter relationship, and the mathematics of nature. So we found an amazing connection and it works out to be the Maltese cross. Yeah. So this does. shape here that you see, the Maltese cross, is why people like Saint Germain, I think I've got a picture of it, but th this, this book has got all the um, essential graphics that we need to sort of show. It's got all the algebra, all the equations. Mm. But all you need to know is one thing called Pythagoras' theorem. To, to get root 5, even though it's an, an irrational number, it can't be derived from whole numbers. What we learned at school was there was a thing called 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared. It was a triangle. Yeah, yeah, basically. And that is enough information to do all the Einstein physics. Just So that would be the second thing I'll teach. I'd, first I'll teach sacred geometry, but now if we're in a maths classroom, for us to to put on these like um, goggles that can see through um, invisibility, to see the invisible world, all you need to know is that 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared, and that opens up a whole universe. So mathematics is a very sacred thing. Yeah. The problem is, is that when kids start getting to algebra and they hear 3 squared, A squared plus B squared oh, plus C squared, yes. they've shut down. Totally. So our job is to make my job is to make mathematics beautiful. That That's all yeah. I'm here to do. And isn't it beautiful? When you look at it from its visual aspect and look at nature, you'll start to see that, it, that it's, a, it's a miracle and, yes. that, and that this spirituality and, and science, like, you know, these, these, these need to be connected and this is yes. what you'll find when you do connect the two. Yeah, and, and the beauty of all this is that I'm just doing humble research, just my passion, and it took me on a journey far beyond my expectations it could be almost like innocence almost naivety yeah just in my ex so th these are portals these just each each one of these um geometries have unique are like unique stargates they hold different memories yes um the, if you looked at the etymology 
of the Hebrew word memori. Memori. Do you know where that comes from? Mem. I I, I know there's a, a goddess called Mem in from the in Egypt. That's right. Um, no, you, you, yeah, you, so, you tell me. <laughs> so so the, the the origin of the word our when we start, say sacred geometry is a memory of who we are. Well, what's memory? In in ancient Hebrew, Mem is water. Yeah. And the Ori is what they worship, the light. The origin of all things is the light. So Mem Ori is a relationship between water and the light. So you know, like say, where I see it like liquid light. That's the image I get. Yeah. You, you know, when you, if I'm sitting on the bank of a river and I'm just looking at a pond of water, sort of water, but let's just say a pond, you, you notice that you can't help going back into memories of when you were a child, for example, or your mother or something, a good memory or a bad memory. But just by looking at water, you, I find... I'm transported in time and space. Yeah. I'm accessing some of my memory bank. It's a mystery. Yeah. But but there's something about liquid light, and and I believe that the the Cheops pyramid is the nature of light. It's really how light geometricizes itself. Like it's invisible, we don't see. But if we could get an electron tunneling microscope and study the fabric of light, I believe it's the pyramids in Egypt. Yeah, there's a there's a lot programmed in there. No it's doubt a, about yes. that. And interestingly enough, pyramid or one etymological um, analysis of pyramid would find pyro, we find pyromaniac from Greek, yeah. with fire and midst, so the fire in the middle. And, 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 and when we get into geometry, yeah. we look at the pyramid and we go in, in the center that, that, you know, we, and then we see it as a merkaba, the masculine and feminine. Then we, we're starting to get, There's a merkaba. We're, we're starting to get into the this, 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 this science yeah. Of, of, of human energy fields, electromagnetic energy fields and consciousness. And this is, mm. as, as, as many people are starting to say now, this, this is the secret to all sorts of things, things that I can't even comprehend. But this is what's inside the cube. There's a total totally. cube. That, that's yeah. the, the fabric, the geometry of space. What, like scientists believe that space is empty. Yeah. Now we know now that space, the vacuum, is rich in geometry, and that's the yeah. geometry of it. Yeah. Absolutely, and, and 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 one more thing as well on on the Egyptians is if you, if you look at a lot of their temple complexes and their architecture, they're designed to to hold specific math, mathematical configurations of sound, in other words, harmonics. So if you make a noise in the pyramids, it resonates in a certain way. The sound travels. Sound travels. Mathematical configurations of sound.